So thank you guys so much for being a part of the project. I think one of the things that we wanted to explore in the project is this idea of different approaches to using spatial audio. Mm -hmm. And obviously the new tools that are available at the L Acoustic system are kind of quite unique, a bit different from other things. So I thought it might be quite nice to talk a bit about the approaches um, but obviously not focusing just on the technology as itself, but mm. obviously our purpose is to use it creatively. Mm. So I think maybe it'd be quite nice to have a chat about how we create creatively applied and use the space and the, mm -hmm. the tools. Um, so as the one person who used the uh, <laughs> Elisa system, uh, what, how was your, what was your experience compared to other spatial audio? Um, so I've usually used amplitude-based panning um, systems, so I've always... Like which systems? Like, um, I, I use Fakri. Okay. It, so curious it's, um, Robert Normando. Normando, yeah. Oh! Mm. Oh my god, I love him. He's like, he is one of the reasons why I wanted to start, like, divorcing from picture and mm. moving in because He's a great composer. His stuff is so incredible. That's funny. And most people don't know him. I mean, lots of, I mean, I don't know. You know, because yeah, it's yeah. more obscure. But I, he is one of my very favorites. I mean, he was the one who kind of made me understand more that cinema could be just in the ear. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. So that's amazing that. Mm. Um, I was curious because you mentioned that you were doing amplitude based panning and I'm not familiar with that and when you mentioned it last night I wanted to ask you what that was and what tools you were using yeah that, that fascinates me um so I wasn't aware that it was amp amplitude based panning until oh. we started talking about Lisa technology and do, doing a comparison that we had amplitude based panning and then we had um object, object yes, yeah. and that object was actually being used in commercial sound for 3d audio and Dolby Atmos and game design and everything. Mm -hmm. So when I had been previously writing pieces of music, they were, the last ones I've done have been eight channel. Um, so I'm using a ring of loud, um, eight loudspeakers. Um, and I found this spat grey, the last piece I wrote, um, I used these uh, spat grey plugins. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're just so easy to use and you can, you, you, you pan your audio throughout the space. Um, and then I suppose it's important, one of the things I'm trying to do is compare these systems. So when we're using that type of system and the SPACRI plugins, that piece is fixed. It's for eight channel. You render it down to eight channel and then you have to go and do another mix for stereo. Right, yeah. And then you have to do another mix for binaural or oh. So they're kind of always fixed, whereas it seems that with Lisa and maybe with all object based panning systems, I'm, I'm not sure because I don't know enough about it, but that you do the piece, but then you can render it for different um, yeah, right. speaker setups. So basically, um, I suppose when you're working, when you're working with the Spacri, you would put the, that plug in on each track. Mm -hmm. And then you're moving the audio within that space. Um, but then with the Lisa system, I, first of all, I tried to be extremely organized <laughs> with my sound files. And um, I had all my tonal stuff and my static stuff together. And I tried very hard to use only mono mm -hmm. sound files because that mm -hmm. was the advice we mm -hmm. were given. Mm -hmm. And it did it does make sense when you use the system. Um, and then you use their plugin on each track, which then communicates with their hardware. Um, and there's, there's, there's two ways of panning. You can use, you can set the track, I think, to snapshot, mm -hmm. where yeah, you are yeah. panning, you're using the touch screen to pan. Mm -hmm. So, if I have the sound of one frog, I can literally just pan it over there. Mm -hmm. um, or you can use the plugin itself and draw your automation, mm -hmm. your panning mm -hmm. automation mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. um, which I found 
I found it really intuitive um, and I'd kind of set it up at home a little bit, but um, I thought it was an absolute amazing way to pan audio. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I noticed there was extraordinary, in your piece when I heard it, the, the precision and clarity, I think, I guess mm. is a good, that, that that I noticed that and that, that, that it was more true to the space in mm. a sense um, and, and felt more effective. You could get like some of your, you had some great radical moves around yeah. the room and they felt more, there was a sort of a physicality to it, I think because of its precision that mm. um, do it working in just ambisonics mm. uh, in a tradition, more traditional setup didn't feel the same. And I noticed that almost mm. immediately with your piece. I thought it was really interesting. Yeah, it was, it was a nice way of working because I basically wrote it at home in stereo, but it wasn't even, like there was no panning in it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't do any panning. So I composed the piece, but I was always imagining, obviously I'd been to the space and I was always like, God, it's, it's just gonna make it so big. I'm gonna make this, because that was the idea, like making this hyper real soundscape. And also you're not just panning it to the speaker. There's, there's distance there as well. Mm -hmm. And they have this reverb Mm -hmm. um, so not only are you sending the sound far away, but then they have this reverb that that um, is added to that sound. Yeah. Um, so some of my sounds, I heard them and they were like outside of the building. They were so far away. It was just really that perspective of, of distance seemed to be really enhanced within the system yeah. um, compared to other ways I've worked. And um, it was really easy, like, um, so I had some sounds of crickets, but often, you know, those static sounds don't just come from there. They come from here, yeah. like a wider space. So you could expand, right. yeah, yeah. you could expand the, um, the width of your audio so it would go across multiple speakers. Mm -hmm. um, and like a lot of the stuff I do is, it, I suppose it's, it's spectral deconstruction of the the soundscape like um and then i was i'd put put it back together uh -huh. within the room uh -huh. so you know i had the high frequency crickets over here uh -huh. and then i had the low the the next level the next frequency band and the next frequency band uh -huh. like the chirps maybe that were mid-range and then uh lower frequency frog uh -huh. calls kind of uh -huh. um back there um oh, that's really cool mm. Yeah, I think the sense of depth and space is just more effective and yeah. more precise in a way. I mean, you've got, I got a demo on this system. Mm. I didn't get to work on it because it wasn't for time reasons. But the, yeah, like the manipulation of space was so effective in it. You could see like, like the combo of the reverbs and the distance stuff mm. and the way they had it constructed and also that you can manipulate that reverb mm. too and do unnatural things oh, with you can, it as yeah, well, yeah. which is really interesting yeah. too. Yeah, because I think about my piece, I didn't really use any reverb when I was kind of constructing mine. Mm -hmm. And I guess that, that yeah, the, having it inbuilt into the system means mm. that it's not an extra thing that you think about adding. It's just kind of inherently there. Mm. So you just fluidly think about positioning the... I had, the... I had, for, I had no reverb at all. All my sounds were dry, because um, from our background, we're like, don't use reverb, um, you know, when you're composing. Because sometimes we get, you can get carried away, and then when you're, when you take your piece then into a reverberant space, it can yes. be game over. The muddiness is just, mm -hmm. there's, you can't, the clarity is gone, mm -hmm. and and you learn that as you go along as a composer. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was a big fan of reverb. And now when I think of it, actually that piece had no reverb in it, only only came after when using the system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting that because yeah, as you say, most of the time we would kind of present pieces in concert halls, mm. which have yeah. have reverb designed into them for the performance. And mm. Bede, when he performed the trumpet piece, he found it quite strange because of how dry yeah. the acoustic of the room was. He wasn't mm. getting that, uh, that response mm. back from the space and for him he found that he was quite separate so the idea of the piece is that he merges into the electronics mm. but he felt that he was 
very separate from it. Mm. Whereas, actually, I don't think that was shared by anyone actually experiencing the piece in the room, which is yeah. quite interesting. But for him at the point source, he said it was quite uh, separate. Yeah, because I'm mm. sh certain that musicians, to a certain extent, rely on that and play with that. And, and manip you know, I mean, his directionality with the trumpet and stuff mm -hmm. and the way it can bounce off things and what he can do with it. Mm -hmm. And suddenly there were tools almost removed from mm, his... That's so true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah fascinating. I mean, and when we captured the recording in, with a third order mic, it was interesting to listen to. His playing is quite prominent. Also, he tended to be sort of walking back and forth past the mic. I mean, he was around the room. But it was funny that it blended better, but I could see that, oh, yeah, like if we were in a place where it was playing off, the blend would be even more... Um, more seamless in a way mm -hmm. he yeah. more pops out of the uh thing which is lovely i think what's cool about that mic is you can go back in and remix it and probably add some reverb to him to kind of blend mm -hmm. it again but it's funny that the recording of a live recording becomes source for the creation of the piece rather than mm. a document of the piece itself because it wasn't really I mean, it was doing a lot of what you wanted to do, but would have been more effective if the room had been had more bounce to it. You know, mm. it's kind of interesting. Yeah, that's so true. I would never have thought of that at yeah. all. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think it was a nice space to have people to move around in, and we asked people to not just sit in a static space as mm. well, to not just have uh, one position mm. and to actually move through the space. Because mm. I think that because we were creating these immersive sound environments, actually they... I mean, did you feel that when you were composing it? Because obviously in the studio, you're sat there and you are in this one sweet spot with the speakers all around you. Mm. But did it? Did you approach it differently than you might do in thinking about, I mean, both cases, did, from a, from an audience sat in a theatre kind of with a, with a fixed forward position or an audience in a, mm. in a concert hall? Do you think that that was in, in your mind when you were composing yeah, either of your pieces? Yeah, um, like... I, I think I, I, I must I knew that it was going to be a walk around that it wasn't seated and all of my concerts or when my pieces are played that's always seated and that's mm -hmm. the problem there is a sweet spot and not everyone gets to experience it you know that poor person is off over there at the yeah. right in front of a, a wide left speaker yeah. and they're missing out and um yeah so I was very conscious that um I mean I stood in the middle for it because I hadn't heard it in the space uh -huh. before I just uh -huh. wanted to hear it but I, 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 I did want people to be able to experience that sense of place um, and that soundscape no matter where they were in the room, that there was, there was no sweet spot. Well, that's um, the cool thing about it, that there's no bad room in the ha bad seat in the house. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, that, and that, you know, yes, you can experience it from the center, but walking like you would. And, mm. and in particularly effective in yours, because it was about that to a certain mm. extent. It's like experiencing a new landscape that mm. you've not heard before and to be able to walk to various corners because I mm. was like really radically moving all through the space mm. to just kind of feel what it was. Mm. And it was amazing. I mean, what you could hear over here versus what you could hear mm. there and always beautifully presented, obviously beautifully immersive. And yet you're moving mm. radically through the quite a large room, yeah. you know, really. Um, I it's, thought it was uh, very cool. It's like, you know, I was thinking about spaces within the soundscape. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, the frogs might have been happening here, but then there was little delicate water. Yes. Like there was a pool over here, mm -hmm. you know, and little insects were. That was kind of my thinking. So that if you went over there. And it was, and it worked. Another, and I did hear, I, yeah. I heard that stuff. And that's mm. what I thought was really gorgeous about it that you could really like literally walk through a field, you know, yeah. in what you had created, which is how it would be in real life. And that is kind of, uh, it was trippy. I mean, it was especially noticeable with yours because of the nature of that piece, mm -hmm. you know, whereas I was trying to create this sort of feeling of just being overwhelmed mm. and completely submerged and and almost a cluster, like it was mm. almost a claustrophobia yep. in a way, yeah. like a heavy, I was trying to create that heaviness of yeah. burdensome kind of almost feel and then a lift. Yep. And so my my piece kind of was, I was trying to collapse to the middle and then open up and collapse. And yes, you could move around, mm. but that, that, that kind of um, 
the shape of it was yeah. almost counter to yours completely, which was what was cool about presenting the works, uh, so many different works, you know, and mm. then yours was completely different again, you know, and, and um, you know, the way you are playing with frequency and how the interaction, and we were talking about your trumpet piece that the standing waves were in mm. fact creating their own movement, which was amazing. I mean, you're using the kind of physics of sound to, uh, to bounce off and manipulate and create, you know, new, new feelings, new yeah. events. And that's the amazing thing about sound. I mean, the yeah. fact that all three of us could just kind of run at it from completely different directions mm. and they were all very, very effective in their own ways is, is uh, I thought that was an amazing thing to hear. Yeah. Yeah. It was quite a uh, cheating really because I let the sound do all the spatialization. Yeah, but that's, it says so much about the medium, doesn't it? I mean that you can do that, that mm. you could, sit static and create so much movement mm -hmm. in an ambisonic environment with static tones. It's mm -hmm. like, it, it talks completely about this wild child mm -hmm. of sound that we, and the medium that we play in and how completely unpredictable and deliciously so in that kind of setting when you set up the, these parameters and allow the sounds to kind of mask, unmask, bounce, phase, do all mm -hmm. these kind of wacky things that in itself creates these kind of feelings mm. and, and pockets of places like in the piece that you made you have all these standing ways but as you moved around that it felt different in different places mm. and was felt and because the standing ways themselves were functioning different mm. in different places and I, I it was it was incredible really i thought it was very effective mm. I well, think, sorry you... i think what i there's actually a lot of similarities between our work as well because mm -hmm. um there was some I think we're big into tonal stuff and yeah, dronal yeah. stuff, yeah. drone stuff, um, because even though I'm kind of, I do a lot of soundscape work, there's always these musical undertones mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that weave through it. And I could hear that in your work yeah. as well at the start. And then and I was like, oh, my God, this is this is amazing. This is so lovely. And then and then you have that cut where it goes to the snow yeah. and it's a beautiful contrast where you like jump into a new space. But it's that snow is so tactile almost mm -hmm. like it's just really beautiful and then your drone stuff um that was that tension like it was yeah pulling the listener in and in and in and you knew something was you knew something was going to happen but like it's it's um you were in no rush to get there yeah. which is which is great you, you the pace was fantastic and then you know what thank you yeah, I can't because for me, hard. Hard. this moment was my first departure from working against picture. And I realized we were talking about this. What I noticed what was freaking me out was my work for the last 25 years has been against picture. I'm playing with it, supporting it, undercutting mm. it, but it provides structure. Yeah. Suddenly, <laughs> and I was, we talked a little bit about this and I was struggling a little with it. I started to rush because it's like, Oh, and I don't know if it's a Canadian me or just my own anxiety, but I was like not wanting to waste people's time in a weird way, like get to the point, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I felt like for the first time I started to kind of was able to start to let go of the mooring of picture mm. and play and, and become more comfortable with allowing that to slowly un reveal and realizing when I was doing it that the amount of tension because there's an anticipation and you're like, you know, I found myself waiting, waiting, and I thought, oh, this is really interesting. And it's something I had never played with before. And in fact, admired in both of your pieces from the first night, it inspired me when I was continued to work. I was like listening to how you both had no hesitation about allowing things to just slowly mm. unfold and transition. And I learned from that in mm. my experiences of the first night and started to play with it. So I really mm. appreciate that because I didn't know if it was too much or perhaps yeah. I was still not, not allowing it, you know? And I do feel in the piece, like it's a work in progress for me. Like I do feel in some places it's rushed a little bit for me of what I actually want to do, but I felt really good about the fact that I actually allowed that mm. or found, you know, got to a place where I started to become comfortable with allowing things to just slowly mm. unroll and that the tension of anticipation, which is what I noticed mm. in both of your pieces, how fantastic and you guys are both playing with that all the time and mm. how 
incredibly effective it was. Mm. And so that gave me inspiration and license mm. to start to play with that too. So it's interesting. I think it's very easy when you're working with sounds and you're listening to them all the time to start to get worried about that and like start to speed up. And I think it is really important to kind of sit back and try and imagine the what someone's going to hear the first time they hear it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's for me, as I always love it, presenting pieces at a concert because you suddenly like you hear it through the audience's ears yes. again. Yes. And um, it is yeah difficult. I think sometimes you can't get this feeling like, oh, I must kind of keep going, keep going, keep mm. going. But actually just leaving space. And that's what we talked about, didn't we, in your piece when it yep. came right down to the bottom and you hit the bottom mm. is actually just to leave people a moment to just yep. Absorb where they are, and to just... it was one of the one of the few adjustments I made because of the way I had to work and this, and I had stems built. Thank God, I had the right combo, mm. and we were listening to it. And Andrew made that suggestion because I was like, oh, and just kind of and and, but I knew that I kind of like as soon as you said it, it was like it like gave me permission in a weird way, yeah. um, and it was very quick and it was extremely effective. It was one tiny fader move for a moment, and then it was like oh. Yes, it opens up, it allows. And I'm, I don't know, it was a, it's a funny thing about that and not working to picture uh, mm. because you then have to provide that, you know, your own, you have to offer up your own internal cadence to a certain extent, mm -hmm. your own sort of sense of pacing or develop that. And it's, yeah. that's probably more than anything, the thing that will be my challenge going forward is to, yeah. to work on that. But I'm very inspired by... You know the work that bo both of you are doing, and other. You know, we were talking about Robert Normando mm. earlier. It's like that kind of stuff. I remember first hearing um, Ju. I love that mm. piece, and yeah. and um, and I have um, so much from that um, uh, Empreinte Digital. Yeah, that, yeah. that I I was just crazed about that because mm. when I was living in Canada, I was actually on count arts councils with a lot of those guys, wow. and I met them and started to learn about it. But mm. from the world I was coming from, I was one of the few people who were working in sound. It was all the electroacoustic community. Mm. But in the art world, nobody was really playing that much with sound. So I was like the kind of the token sound person on a yeah. lot of tours. But I, it allowed me to be introduced to that stuff and talk to a lot of those guys and see what they were doing. And, um, and then I discovered Robert's work in particular, mm. which I'm, uh, I mean, has always been on my shelf when I want to listen to stuff. And, mm. and actually that you brought it up in this context, I, I'll go back now and listen yeah. because, you know, um, the kind of whole concept of music concrete is like fascinating to me. And I think mm. he didn't, he coined the term acousmatics, like cinema of the ear. You know, I remember reading some stuff that he talked about and, um, and, and thinking just that phrase, cinema for the ear, mm. it was like, it was a radical concept at the time when he first yeah. started talking about it. But it was the thing that spoke to me the most. But I remember that's why I left the art world. That's why I went wandering off into cinema to discover and learn those tools. And now here I am coming back all these years later. It's like, okay, maybe I'm ready now. I, I don't know, you know, but it's... I think, yeah, I think you need to keep doing, keep working. Doing it. Well, I'm super was, inspired to do that. It was that. great, yeah. Oh, thank you. I, yeah. I was super inspired, and I, like I said, to be able to um, be in this space, hold this space with mm. you both who have been working in mm. this. It's been incredibly uh, exciting for me. It's like a whole brand new playground. So it's. Uh, I think, I think what well, what I find about the three of us, our work, is that it's it's very emotional. Yes. Um, I found that I find that about my soundscape stuff because not only <laughs> it's when you listen back to the recordings, you know exactly where you were, yes, when you recorded it, what you were wearing, and what kind of mood you were in. Yeah, you know that you were in Florida on holidays recording, or you were in Australia or wherever. And um, I find that that kind of I don't know. I think. There's an awful lot of emotion in, in there. It mightn't be apparent to the listener, but... Oh, no, it was. I mean, it translates because there's yeah. something very deep about it. And I think, I too, I mean, even in my my work for film and TV, it's all it's always, especially over the last few years and, and just life experience and stuff, mm, yeah. has come to this place where I, I realize how 
impactful being vulnerable in the work and bringing emotionality into it, what that means. And I've talked a lot about um, there is a kind of a dialogue that's mm. set up where, you know, you express and it's received and it's received on the terms of the listener through their own filter. Yeah. But on a very primal level, you are engaging and communicating. And that, to me, has been the source of my work, my growth and my work, my healing as a human, my mm. evolution as a human. And it's very powerful stuff. And I agree. I think in all three of our works, coming at it from different places, there is a feeling. And that's, you know, I always say, like, in the work that I'm doing, because I will do a lot of fantasy stuff, you know, mm. If I can make you feel something, mm -hmm. I can convince you of things that, you know, that exist that don't exist. It's yeah. like there's a trust that goes on and there's, it's like once, once, once the listener or the viewer opens like that, the yeah. door opens and your doors are already open. Suddenly there's, there's this thing and you can now take, you know, hand in hand, we can go to new places and it's a really interesting place. And I think emotionality and work is it's everything and yes i agree i think in all three works i think there's a power and a and a i don't know there's something there for the for the viewer to chew on you yeah. know yeah. i think it's really interesting because one time somebody said to me like that my piece they kind of listened to my piece and they said well where's 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 the kind of the energy and where's the response because a lot of electroacoustic music especially in the uk is very kind of gestural and it's very kind of got this strong loud forceful sounds and that's yeah. possibly to do with the kinds of people that are creating the music that that's mm -hmm. you know it's it's this kind of very male dominated area and they're creating these very strong big impressive whoosh bang mm. gestures but for me i think i have always felt that actually i like sitting back and just mm. having things that are much more restrained and I don't think that they are any less emotional in fact I think that they're more mm. emotional than some of these big gestures that are just kind of showy yeah you know I think that actually um for me yeah it was it was about in my piece uh, the still a lead piece it was about that wonder of being there in the mountain and exploring mm. the <laughs> playfulness of exploring those yeah. amazing sounds that were there mm. but also yeah, this kind of sense of awe of being on this mountain, being surrounded by nature that is kind of beautiful, but also a bit terrifying as well, because you know and humbling. that it's... And humbling. Absolutely, yeah. 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 And I think, I don't know, I've had this theory for a while that may or may not be a very popular thing to say, but I do very much believe it. I think women relate to sound naturally in a very different way, and it's something in some ways that has been overlooked. I think women naturally have an emotional connection. I think men, I, it's all on a spectrum, of course, but I think in general, because I've always felt like, first of all, our hearing range is different. You know, we have a, a different hearing range. And also, I think biologically, in some way, we're tuned to, in, in a split second, interpret emotionality in a sound because, like, you take it back to the biological thing of having babies or whatever, and, uh, and there's a child's cry, and to be able to interpret in a split second what that cry is. Is it happy? Is it sad? Is it danger? Is it, you know, whatever, pain? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a, it's, there is something there for me, I think, and I think it's like you say, I mean, if you think about more male dominated sound practices, you've got stuff that tends to be a little more, more cut off in that where I think women, I don't know, in general, I think women go there quicker and with a little bit more ease. I, I've even noticed in my piece and collecting is a fascinating document, a social document. I collected all these vocal samples of, peop of people saying my tears mm. from all over the world. Mm. Very few men did it. The men that did it, um, most, there was a couple that I could hear their vulnerability, but most were like, you know, my tears, my tears, my tears. Like it mm. was so, they said the words, mm. you know. Mm. Women were all over the place. What I heard more was there was emotionality, but there was also some often discomfort right? Mm. The most, the ones that went straight for my heart the fastest, there happened to be two children. They were so open. They probably understood less about what was going on and what the project was. And it was absolutely 
vulnerable and and pure, mm. a pure expression. And I just because I listen to each and every one, I carefully cleaned them and and you know and and played with them to see how I could present them the best. What a fascinating mm. document of. Yeah of allowing and even the comments about people who were thinking about doing it mm -hmm. you know i had you know a friend from high school who's a pastor i mean he he deals with this all the time he and mm -hmm. he was he didn't understand at first when he read it he misread it and he said oh i understand oh it's a, mm -hmm. kind of a moment for self-reflection isn't it and i said yeah and he goes i'm gonna have to go away and think about that and i'm still waiting to hear back from him <laughs> but it but isn't it interesting you know there is a, a man who you know, I know he's a very compassionate man, and I know he helps people in their times of, of, of difficulty. And yet, the thought of self re that that self reflection and vulnerability, mm -hmm. and I, I it, it's it's something that fascinates me about sound in particular because I think it's a medium that is visceral and physical and primal and mm -hmm. often very emotionally charged. And even when someone tries to distance, even the the big gestural, loud, bangy stuff. Mm -hmm. That's an expression of an emotion, you know. It may not be something that we want to face, but a lot of it has to do with, you know, I mean, there's a primality and a and a yeah. and a conquering and a mm. and a you know a, 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 an explosive, you know, and and it's cool stuff. Some of it's amazing, and it mm. makes me feel a certain way when I feel when I hear it, though. And it's, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's um, that part of sound to me is one of the most fascinating parts, mm. kind of psychological. Yeah. And I think you said the other day that it's about that immediacy that you can hear a sound and instantly you get so much information straight away Absolutely. from it. And I think that's for I think in all of our pieces that we maybe some of these very strong gestural pieces are all about control and being able to take sounds and manipulate them and bend them to your will. Whereas I think actually in our pieces, a lot of it was about respecting the mm. sounds and letting the soundscapes flow and be themselves and it's just about kind of more gently guiding and shaping and yeah it's it's harder to do i think if you don't have because i used to panic about you know when not having enough gestures because the <laughs> gesture leads somewhere or it ends something yeah. and you're using the gesture to phrase and to structure your composition yeah and like there's very little gestures in my stuff but um Oh no, yours is very gestural. I thought in a in yeah. a but in a very different way. Yeah, I maybe. Mean, yeah. yeah, I think. Yeah, I, I think. think I'm no, thinking, that's the thing. It's not. Yeah. A it's that's what I'm saying. It's like there's a different way at it yeah. because the traditional concept of gesture is bam, 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 slang. Yeah. Close that door. Open this door. Yeah. And that's you are your work is in has mm. so much like what I noticed about it. I mean, it's funny you would say that because what I noticed <laughs> about it, it had so much phrasing. It had. I mean, yeah. you're using sound sound effects with such phrasing such a uh, such a mm. Mm. Uh, there's such poetry in it and there's so much like i went on this incredible journey in this space even though you had these these fields and areas and still the way they would kind of move and flow mm. and we'd dive down and we'd lift mm. up and it's insanely gestural okay. but not in a traditional way yeah <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. I think when I when I'm saying that, I'm talking about like the way we learned electroacoustic composition and from that tradition. You yeah. know, when you're analyzing yeah. works and this, whether the gesture is an agglomeration or, um, you know, where it's leading. Mm. But I think because we don't, we none of our works are like, you know, we have this little 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 little, and it goes, and then we have this explosion, and then there's a stop, and then it leads to the next step, and then. Yeah. Gesture, diddle, you know. Um, I think the structure. Had that go again? <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the structure isn't. There is a there's a clear structure and there's phrasing, but um, perhaps it's a we, maybe we find it a little bit harder to analyze or discuss. Maybe I don't know. Well, I think what's interesting about it too, like when I listened actually to both your work. I mean, you go on this journey that you don't even realize you're on mm. until you're way down the road. Mm. And there's a there's a gentleness to it, mm. um, but it's very clear, like, uh, you know, looking back on the piece and thinking about it, it's like, oh, yes, you know. I mean, you had some powerful, powerful stuff in your piece, moments, and, you know, in, in a piece about 
frogs and landscape, you know, some of the stuff was in, mm. you know, there were these really intense moments, these beautiful, quiet moments, mm. the shifts and changes, but you don't even realize you're in the journey, whereas mm. some pieces like grab you by the shoulders and slam you up against the wall and throw you on the floor and yeah. pick you, you know, and it's like, that's not what these pieces are about. There's a, I think also we've all attracted to drones in a way mm. because it's a gentle way of, 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 of lifting someone, mm. you know, on this like magic carpet ride we're taking. Yeah. And it's a gentle uh, way to engage in conversation mm. in a sense, you know, because yeah. it's what we're doing. We're telling stories. Absolutely. You know? yeah. I think yeah, it leaves that space for people to immerse themselves mm. in the soundscape. You're not just, like you say, you're not kind of dragging them around mm. and forcing them to do something. You're just kind of, what I like is, is opening the soundscape up and allowing them to exist mm. within it. And in fact, actually taking the pieces into the context of this space really allowed that even more. The fact that they we did allow them to move around and that they were completely surrounded by these yeah. sounds meant that they were situated in these soundscapes. And yeah, I think it's funny if you jump, you know, from you know first minute to the third minute to the fifth mm. minute, you'll hear massive changes in the pieces. Yeah. But actually, when you listen to it in real time, you don't consciously necessarily notice it because it's these longer form. The other thing yeah. that was phenomenal is that all of our pieces were well over 10 minutes. You know, I think mine was around 12. You had some 14 minute pieces. Yeah, I mean, and you don't even notice that the time passing. I mean, you're just in this space. Um, Whereas I've been, like, these are extraordinary long in, in some senses. Mm. You think about traditional, like, a song or a thing yeah. that we're doing. And it's like, the time passes because you don't know this because you're on this journey and you're going places with, just with sound. And the sound, the places you're going, are it's all about primality mm. and emotionality. I mean, it's all constructed. And it's part of it, I think, when you give that kind of space, it does allow people to insert their own journey in it. Yeah. along the way and interpret that and it becomes almost a personalized experience mm. um and that's i mean when time flies like that and you it's like what it's over already like mm. I, like i heard your piece twice twice no but it was and the second time went even almost faster i'm like wait it's over already oh my god you know the first time i was listening i was in awe the second time I really tried to walk around and, and experience all the different places because I had heard stuff, but yeah. I was more static the first time. And the walking through the space and experiencing over here and then moving over here, and then suddenly it was done. And I'm like, wait a minute. Wow, it's over already? That's crazy. You know, yeah. the, the, because time mm. time stops almost when there's a, 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 a... It's like when you... You know, when you're thinking about something, you get lost in thought, mm -hmm. right? And you, and time melts and it disappears and you're not actually in a time, you're not on a timeline anymore. You're mm -hmm. in your own kind of place and you're dreaming in a way. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, there was something about mm -hmm. that that happened for me that I noticed that was really quite, it's, quite beautiful. It's, it's good that you say that because, I mean, that is one of the things you, I, I would hate. We've been to those concerts where you hear those pieces and you're like, why didn't you end that five minutes ago? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. why is it still going on? Like, um, you know, when they've had they've had about three ending opportunities. Yeah. Um, but I got I got very confused when I was listening back to it because the piece is 15 minutes, I think. Um, and it was the first time to listen to it in that space. Oh, yeah. And I was like, Jesus, this is going on forever. This is taking ages. And then I, got, I was like, what did I do next? What happens next? I was like, oh yeah, now we have this moment. And then, okay, so it's nearly finished. And I was, it just sounded so different in the mm -hmm. space. And I actually forgot. It was like the whole composition had been a blur and I had forgotten what I'd done, but maybe I was just so immersed in it. I don't know, it was, it was very strange. It seemed to go on for ages, but no. then that's a different, that's kind of. That's your own anxiety. Well, that's the anxiety, because yeah. I got that in my piece yeah. as well. I'm like, oh God, this is. Well, and I had, so my first, when I did the little, because we had to give a talk when I first arrived, and it was really, I felt very unprepared, but I did a very kind of quick mock-up, and it was six minutes long, and I'm like, that's crazy. And and when I put all these pieces together, it ended up being 12 minutes, mm. but when I would listen to it, 
I would get lost in my own mm. thing every time. And it's like, that doesn't feel like anything. It's crazy. Mm. And even even last night, I was like, wow, because, you know, I can get antsy too at some, mm. like, for those things as well. And that's that was part of my, what we were talking about giving space, is my mm. anxiety. It was like, oh, like the last thing you want is someone going... Or checking oh, their absolutely. phone, you know, yeah. but it's not what it was. And I think when what I've learned from that is when you allow space for people to engage in their own private way in a mm. space, it doesn't become if you're imposing something on somebody and they mm. don't feel like there's a place to insert themselves. then I think that's where it starts to feel long because yeah. you're. You're sitting on the outside with your face pressed up the window. It's like, all right, get on with it already. I don't know. Yeah. This isn't about me, but I get it. It's lovely, whatever. But when, it, and especially I think also in the immersive format, when you're in it, you're encouraged to engage in a completely mm. different way. And I think it made all the pieces were quite long, and yet all mm. of them felt like, I don't know, it mm. was like, it was crazy. I could have listened to them all night long, I think. It was nuts. Yeah, I, I think, think, sorry. No, no, I was just going to say that the, the allowing people to mm. take take their own, you know, letting them, the, the audience, be a part of the piece, I think, is a really important yeah. thing. Sorry. But I was just thinking about our role. I think maybe I felt that it was so long was because I was actually, OK, I composed it, but I was also in the audience. Mm -hmm. And all I had to do was listen. Usually when we perform the works, you're in a concert oh. and you're diffusing it over, you're doing live sound diffusion so you're you're controlling the spread of that image across an orchestra of loudspeakers so you're busy and you're thinking you're listening in a different way but then when you've nothing to do you're just you're just you're a member of the audience so I think then your perception changes again because oh, you're not you're very not trippy I never so even like, thought about that so it's like oh god I've nothing to do I just have to listen yeah. and then so then you're listening and it's like I think maybe that's why and then yeah. you get lost yeah that's amazing yeah you think you would take forward from this project for next projects, for future projects? Is there anything specific you think that you kind of discovered or learned in this that might inform future practices? Mm. Oh, well, this is my new playground. I mean, it's, it's, all, it's all new to me. You mm. know, when I work in a medium that is subservient to picture, that is absolutely, and I bucket that and play with that as much as I can. I, I play with trying to, you know, even I've, I've done some stuff where I'm, you know, trying to manipulate time sometimes, try to see, can you show, you know, can you slow down time slightly with playing mm -hmm. around? Like I try to work in that box and, 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 and stretch it and push the parameters of it as much as I can to have that gone and to be alleviate like from that. Like I said, it's been my greatest source of anxiety on this. But discovering it um, in this very gentle, lovely way with other sound people and just, I don't mm. know, it was a very, um, it felt like a very supportive space mm. to f kind of venture out for the first time. And... And now, and I, what I wonder for myself is, as I start doing more of this, how it will inform the work that I have been doing. And <laughs> wow. that will, because I tend to, uh, sometimes I know in my own work, I mean, part of it is that I always have to provide uh, options or the ability of options for things to be stripped away uh, depending on what else is going on. Like mm. we often don't know what's happening with music or maybe they want to restructure whatever. So I have to, I'm constantly doing that. But I do find that there are times that I will overcomplicate things just of my own desire mm. to, um, I don't know, to, to, like I say, bend and stretch the parameters, but also give options, et cetera, et cetera, and try to come up with things that, um, work together all together but if you take this away or that away or this away it still works so it's kind of a weird headspace for designing it but I do think that I do um, there's an anxiety that comes in there too and I wonder as I release and, and, and breathe a little more in perhaps in my own work how that will inform the work that I'm doing mm -hmm. 
you know, is, is my job right now, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I'm fascinated by that, and I, and I love it, and I can't wait to continue on, but it's, uh, it's a huge, I mean, ambisonics itself, but, and technically, but the technical stuff constantly changes. I mean, mm -hmm. what we're using today, we won't be using a year from now, et cetera, et mm -hmm. cetera. But the concept of immersion and what, what is accomplished, and I learned a lot by this experience, just, you know, again, having the standing walking mm -hmm. experience, for instance, and how kind of cool that is, and also that we could share you know, 40 people, mm. an ambisonic experience, which mm. usually is, you know, we're doing on headphones and now suddenly we're able, you know, or, or you're doing it in VR with headsets mm. and stuff, which tends to be a very kind of isolated experience and people are looking for ways to open that up. But this was kind of really unique in that way that you mm. could, you know, and I guess for concerts too, for, for you guys who are, you know, used to performing, Definitely. The ability to share it in such a new way mm. must be really, I don't know, must be really interesting mm. for you guys. I think for me, it's, uh, I'm, I've been thinking about if we do the trumpet piece again or when we do it again, it's going to be really interesting how we can adapt it to another system. Like, yeah. could, could it work in a concert hall where mm. B will, he maybe can walk up and down the aisle, but he won't have that fluidity, that freedom to move. Uh, you know, in and amongst the space. Mm. Um, so I do think that that's really interesting thing that I hope to explore a bit more now, this kind yeah. of... And, and yeah, I think it does change the way that audiences relate to it. It kind of is nice, that informality of it. Mm. And that mm. uh, Again, it's it's offering up that freedom to the audience, which you don't get. If you're the, the composer that mm. has created this piece and you must sit there and mm. listen to it as I've done it, whereas yeah. actually you're saying now, well, actually, you know what, guys, just come into this space and mm. here we'll all move around and kind of they can remix the piece as they move mm. through the space. Mm. And That's I think interesting. Being open to that is quite, uh, yeah, an exciting opportunity. Well, and I also, because I'm coming at it from such, it's like I'm also fascinated with the concept of performing something that is mm. sonic for people because that's so, I mean, in the job that I'm in, you know, mm. The better you are at your job, the more invisible. It's like yeah. <laughs> there is no, mm. you don't want to see what the seams are. You don't want to see what's behind the curtain. Mm. It's all, it's all, you know, smoke and mirrors in a way, mm. right? And so the concept of like standing out in front of the curtain and doing something and, you know, hearing you guys' experience about, you've talked about diffusion performances. You've talked about them. I've not actually experienced that. And I'm like, yeah. Mm, diffusion mm. performances. What? We'll have to get you back over. Yeah, you're gonna come and bring do it. One next but time. no, but it's it's you know. Well, I've thought for a long time mm. that this piece, because I used to play drums and percussion, mm. and that I could maybe take a set, you know, MIDI set, and play some stuff that way, or perform it that way, or something. I mean, I've had that in my mind for a while, or performing the piece. But I mean, that probably is the most terrifying thing of all for me, because <laughs> I'm not used to it. You know, it's like. I've said for a long time, it's like I've hidden behind everybody else's vision also for mm. 25 years. And so to step out and say, ah, this is me, this came from me completely is was is a very vulnerable place to stand, you know. Mm. And I have great respect for both of you for having done that for all of your careers. So it's really cool. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think that and there were loads of really great comments from audience members who mm. really appreciate it. I think we no matter what you do even everybody working in sound still expects there to be a kind of strong visual mm. element so mm -hmm. actually to subtract that away mm. and l allow people to just experience the sound i think lots of people found that really rewarding oh yeah a lot of those sound people are i mm. know them There's a lot of game audio dudes there a lot of game audio mm. and a lot of film people you yeah. know i know i know them i mean i you know, there are people I know mm. from Facebook or whatever social yeah. media that we've connected in our community, and the community is not that big, but they're all visually mm. based um, sound people. You yeah. Know, so most it, of them. It was a different audience than I would be, that that would that would normally come oh, to yeah, yeah. our I concerts. Yeah. About that, yeah. It was very a non-academic maybe. Yeah. Audience. Yeah. Every, anyone who came, I think five people came up to me, and they were um, a few of them were game audio people. So that was really interesting, and they were, they were, just curious in how I worked um, because they, two of them were actually into field recording, um, and they were trying. They were doing some maybe mini projects, 
outside of their game design stuff and um, but they were trying to find their voice I think and they were trying mm. to discover how to use it without you know not using it as fully or whatever using without it in using different the structure of picture yeah, you know absolutely, that's exactly yeah. what it is yeah, yeah so that was that was that was really interesting they were like questioning it and going just genuine curious and it, and it was it was uh, well the question becomes and it's funny it's like exactly what his experience is like where does the structure come mm. from where where how do you i mean because it's endless i mean sound mm. is already endless mm. um and so many of us are are you know cling mm. cling and, and it's wonderful i so love working against pictures. It's, it's, it's mm. a it's a joy. I mean, depends on the picture, of course. But mm. you know, I've had the uh, opportunity in my career to work on some pretty phenomenal mm. things that allowed me to really play with with the concept of you know, I don't know, the tactile, the you know, and the deep storytelling and what mm. I could bring to it and how I could change, you know. But this is something, I mean, it's both freeing and terrifying because it's like it must come. You have to listen to your own cadence. You have to listen to your own voice. You have to listen to your own patterning. And it is very, very unique mm. to the self, both in the curation of the sounds yeah. that you choose, but also in the in the way that you deliver them, express them, and to tell the story. And it's like, it's a really, um, it's absolutely fascinating to me. It's, it's uh and it's funny, I've waited all these years to do it. And so, but then I, when I, it started to become a thing that I could do, I started to back away from it because I was out of sheer terror. And now I'm really fired up about it, you mm. know, and thank you to both of you for being a big inspiration in that. Thank because you. I really, uh, both of your works really uh, moved me both as a listener, but also as a creator who wants to um, explore that kind mm. of uh, space, which is... It's yeah. It's I think what I what I loved about it was, I felt there was a real clarity to this work, mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, you know, very specific sound sources coming from right there, you know, working with mono recordings and, mm -hmm. you know, this little chirp is you could just you you could really I must touch it. Yeah, yeah, the detail in the piece just seemed to come out even more within the space, and obviously the environment that I was creating was even bigger. Um, and I have never felt that really before. Mm. You know, when you're writing for a channel or even when it's diffused, this just seemed more realistic. And um, yeah, I just loved the detail in it. Yeah. And the clarity. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Mm. I agree. Yeah. When you feel like you can you yeah know, touch something yeah. or you can it's that's the thing it's like, sound you, you know or you're yeah, yeah it's like <laughs> yeah. you know i don't know there's uh um this immersive like the sort of whole 3d audio i mean i've always wanted to play in this field and it's so the tools are becoming so sophisticated that my goodness i mean and god knows where they'll go i mean it's like yeah you know, object panning is really, really new. You mm. know, I mean, it started with Atmos and it's trickled down to mm. these other formats, and um, and God only knows what else they'll come up with because mm. now you've got you know things where you can mix with headsets and grab sounds and do all mm. this kind of crazy stuff, and it's going to continue on and keep transforming. And I think it's, uh, you know, I've been I've been mesmerized by the VR platform mm. also. Yeah. And what uh, what you know, one of the things I've talked about. In the past, is that that it, that I'm drawn to is that, um, you know, you can place a sound and walk around it, and you can also defy the laws of physics with it, which is something we're always. I mean, it's like you're using the laws of physics in your piece mm -hmm. to create these kind of crazy sonic, um, this crazy sonic movement, but you know. It's an acknowledgement of what we deal with on a daily basis. It's the speaker systems. It's it's the place. It's the you know the room. You know you take all that away. You go into a VR space, and suddenly you can start to do things with sound mm. that are not physically possible in the real world. Yeah. And it's like I like all the sort of storytelling, but what interests me the most is being able to subvert those things that we have we've been slaves to pretty much, like having to always you know worry. It's like oh. 
listen to it on the headphones, you can hear, or, oh, I'm sorry, your speakers are bad, and, or mm. whatever, or like you were saying, like, learning to not use reverb mm. when you're presenting yeah. in a space because it'll get, you know, these are all things mm. that, that they're like workarounds. We're always like working with workarounds, and then suddenly you're in this place where it's like, there are no more rules. Mm. There are no more rules. Like, I, I imagine passing through walls of sound that don't, like, they're just crazy things that you could do that... You can isolate things. You could do weird stuff with things mm. that you're not able to do. Yeah. And, you know, I'm thinking a long time about, like, sound sculptures where you could move around it and, yeah. he, you yeah. know, and it's kind of almost the opposite of what we're experiencing, you know, with this space that we were talking about. You know, you create this landscape. You can walk over here and hear this thing and mm. little trickle and little insects hopping around and you go over there and mm. you're in a, in, a, in a little kind of a, a nest of frogs and, you know... Yeah. You are you're approaching that in a way, but then take away, you know, having having the room, even the acoustics in the room mm -hmm. and the way it's all dialed in. It's like, oh, now we're in this space where you can pretty much do mm -hmm. anything. And it's all created for headphones. You never have to worry about, you know, it was like headsets and mm -hmm. stuff. You don't have to worry about um, you know, how everybody will be listening to you because they can only listen to it in this way. So now now the acoustics of space and the mm. sort of geophony is taken away yeah. and you're into um, manipulating pure sound, you know, even mm. with their reverbs that they were playing with yeah. in, in, in Elisa, it's like, you know, you could do things that are not mm. actually physically possible. And they are, you know, in talking to some of their R&D guys, they're like analyzing acoustic, you know, getting into psychoacoustics and analyzing mm. the, the kind of, kind of the, the, you know, the way space functions and stuff and then trying to, uh, you know, right now they're trying to recreate it and to give options, but how about when you take it all away and you start and you do something completely different mm. that is, you know, and how will that feel, you know, when you don't have this, I don't know. Mm. It's, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. And I think that's another thing that they've said, that they've been really pleased that we have... Uh, come in and use the system in ways that they would yeah. never mm. done before. You know, they made it primarily, they maybe have like, I don't know, 12 or 16 sources where they're placing pe like instruments from the orchestra mm. on a virtual stage. But then for us to come and mm. to have, you know, 30, 40, 50 objects that mm. are moving around the room that are using the space, they said, mm. you know, this is the first time they've heard people really use all of the mm. speakers in there completely the surrounds as well yeah. as the front. Thank God if they put overheads in that room. Oh, Dear God. God. I mean, that's the thing. The only thing missing for that for mm. me was the elevation, which, you know, because I had this feeling in my piece where mm. I wanted stuff from below yeah. to come up and pass yeah. as you're moving, but also that you feel like you're falling down. And mm. I, so I started playing with frequencies to kind of like mm. psychologically give you that feeling. But what if you actually could simulate that sonically and yeah. that's the one thing in that room that was missing mm. which i'm sure will i mean you could do it in their studio but it, they don't, don't have it set up in that room but it's like but that's all stuff that's coming and it's mm. like that's what's really super exciting is that we get to play with that stuff how physically yeah. that feels you know and i think yeah it's the even but even yeah you're completely right but that system alone i felt because it's so because you have all of the bass mm -hmm. um, speakers around, because um, it's so symmetrical, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, like if we have a concert environment, you might have tweeters up here. Yeah. Um, but because this was, there was an underwater part and, and it felt that because it was all, um, a lot of the low frequencies were coming from quite a lot of different directions. Yep. It made it more realistic rather than having like, say in a concert environment when we're doing a diffusion, there might, I don't know, we might have four subwoofers mm -hmm. um, and they might be like, in, they'll be in pairs and there might be two there and two here. Whereas this is like all around you, all around you. and then you have, you know, spectrally, it, it's fantastic in how it delivers the piece back. Well, and you what know, I noticed was that this song, because when I heard the first time we went in and I was listening to your piece and then heard your piece, what I noticed was because I had my initial pass was all kind of low end water stuff mm. and whatever. And so it kind of stuck to the walls and stayed down at the bottom. And yeah. what I noticed was that this, the higher the sonic frequencies, mm. they'd start to gather up here. 
Yeah. So that's why I started doing these tones that started yeah, yeah. high and diving because yeah. I realized you could almost simulate the feel of Absolutely. elevation by mm. playing with the, the, the sonic spectrum yeah. and manipulating it to kind of get the effect, yeah. which was, and it, it was kind of effective yeah. I and mean, it really worked. I yeah. noticed in your piece in particular, because you had so much low end stuff, mm. you were there and the frogs would kind of they feel like my stuff initially when I just did this quick pass because I didn't know. I mean, mm. I'm not, you know, I had no know what to expect. But what I felt was that it wasn't filling the space in the middle. And as soon as I heard you guys with all your tonal stuff, well, yours was doing something. You were cheating. You were Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were, because of the standing waves, they were naturally going in and out, you know. But with your stuff, it was the 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 high frequencies you really felt like they were up here and then the low stuff mm. there was this kind of funny spatial thing going on yeah. and it's like oh i get it mm. <laughs> i mean i did, I so did thanks for yeah that. oh well thanks because <laughs> I, I suppose when i think about it i do use the full sp frequency spectrum like some of yeah, those you sure do. some of those soundscapes that i do and i always analyze them and take them apart but they're they are they are from 20 to 20 yep. thousand yep. and then and i kind of i suppose the structure of my piece almost is based on the original so that there is, you're you're st yeah. you're getting the whole frequency yep. range. Yeah, yeah. No, it felt like that, and yeah. I and I, as I learned from the first night and listened to your piece, I was like, oh, I see. That. Like I could feel, I could <laughs> feel it, and I could feel the effect of it. And I was like, oh. Yeah. And I think I said that to you. It's like I get it. The high tones are really yeah. filling. You could yeah. pull them into the room, and even though all the speakers are stuck to the sides walls in a way, the illusion of them being more here or more there comes from frequency play more than Absolutely. anything else and that's mm. so that's why I started to kind of you know because I wanted mm. this feeling of ascension and dissension you know yeah. it's like and how do I do that and I was messing about with it trying and it wasn't working the way I thought until I heard you guys and it was like oh, <laughs> note to sell <laughs> <laughs> yeah so. awesome cool well, I yeah. think that's that was an awesome conversation. <laughs> yeah. Awesome.